Good morning. Did you know that you're beautiful? The Lord Jesus sees you as beautiful. You are his precious treasure. Isn't that a wonderful, comforting thought? It is an awesome thing to stand behind the sacred desk and represent the master of the universe. It's an awesome thing. And I don't know that you maybe would realize the importance of what the Ketz family did for us this morning. That music just sets the tone for me because of who I represent. And that is a real ministry. Where are you? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Father in heaven, use my lips and our ears this morning. And for this we give you praise. In the name of Jesus, amen. Two men had an unreconcilable argument. And to settle the matter, they went to a judge for arbitration. The plaintiff made his case. He was very eloquent and very persuasive with his reasoning. And when he had finished, the judge nodded in approval and he said, That's right. That's right. Well, on hearing this, the defendant jumped up and he said, Judge, wait a minute, you haven't heard my side of the case. And the judge said, well, okay, let's hear your case. And the defendant, too, was very eloquent and very persuasive. And when he finished, the judge said, that's right. That's right. And the clerk of court, he said, well, wait a minute, judge. I mean, they can't both be right. And the judge looked at the clerk of court and he said, that's right, that's right. You say, well, Pastor Dan, where are you going with this? A fellow minister of mine said, Pastor Dan, Bill Hybels, Paul Borden, Rick Warren, these guys have a lot of good ideas, don't you agree? I said, that's right. That's right. But there's a lot of good in a quart of orange juice. All it takes is one drop of arsenic, and it poisons a whole quart. That's right. (laughs) He says, Dan, you have a closed mind. You think you're right and everyone else is wrong. You need to be more tolerant of other people's ideas. You need to be more open to change. I mean, yours is a self-righteous, smug attitude. I mean, it's, it's really a matter of opinion. I said, no, no, not really. It's not a matter of opinion. It's a matter of a thus saith the Lord. What does Jeremiah say in his 13th chapter? Can a, an Ethiopian change his color? Can a leopard change his spots? Can a true faithful Seventh-day Adventist change the word of God and the councils of the church for the sake of political correctness or religious tolerance and compatibility? Can they? But today everything is relative. Many folks think it's wrong to be right. When you consider what you believe to be right, many will accuse you of setting yourself up as judge and jury. And they say that your opinion may opinion may offend someone else who may be of a different opinion. I mean, do you think you're better than anyone else? Of course not. None of us think we're better than anyone else, do we? Do we think we're better than anyone else? I mean, how dare you call yourself the remnant? 
But beloved, because of these ideas, most professed Christians are reluctant to express that which is right for fear that it may be offensive to someone. Are you hearing me this morning? You know what I'm speaking of, don't you? We become irrelevant then in the realm of spiritual things. Like the judge in our story, we, we live in a culture that considers everything to be relative. I mean, how many times have you heard these statements? Well, what's, what's right for you may not be what's right for me. Or, uh, it feels good. If it feels good, do it. Or, nothing is right or wrong. There are just d- different opinions. Who are you to judge? You've heard many of those statements. I've been told concerning my convictions on God's truth. That's your perception. I had my own conference president tell me one time, he said, Dan, that's the way you perceive the issue. But when one is blinded to truth, it matters not how much scripture or how much spirit of prophecy counsel you use, they will obstinately stick by their guns. That's the way you perceive it. You see, it has become today a matter of perception, not of concrete, absolute truth. And all of this is a result of the feeling that there is no absolute truth. I mean, they say, you're entitled to your truth, and I'm entitled to mine. That's a false statement. That's really not true, you know, because you really don't have a right to your truth. Your thoughts are totally unacceptable to that person. In the arena of the church today, the liberal neo-Adventist points his finger at the one who stands for biblical truth and that which is right. And he says, this individual is being unfair. He's being unjust and unloving to put himself in a position where he is right and those around him would be considered wrong. That's not good. I mean, we can't win friends and influence people with that kind of of concept or better than thou attitude. I mean, that's what they think. Bless their hearts, I know they mean well. Oprah Winfrey grew up in the Baptist church. And she still claims to be a Christian. And she says that there are many ways to God... While she believes that Jesus is the one for her, is the way for her, she believes that there are as many ways to God as there are people on the planet. Now, this lady has a tremendous influence over millions of people. Many of them profess Christians. Well, how do we reconcile this kind of statement with what our blessed Lord says? What does he say? I am the way, the truth and the light and no one comes unto me except uh, to the Father, I'm sorry, except through me. John 14, verse 6. Listen, beloved, the Jesus way is the absolute way. And my goal is to line up with the absolute way as closely as I can with His help and His Spirit. Is that your desire? this morning? If all religious ideologies are different pathways to God's kingdom, if that were true, what Mrs. Winfrey says, then why do we need evangelism? Why should we even attempt to convince anyone of certain Bible truths? I mean, after all, it's all relative anyway. Relativism should lead us into a blissful utopianism where we all get along together because of our uh, because because of we respect the beliefs of one another and we should respect one another don't get me wrong but it's not going to be a utopianism it sounds great doesn't it sounds wonderful but it's not that easy and it doesn't work that way my sister-in-law died here a few months back and I went, I went to the funeral service At the close of the service, we went down to the fellowship hall for a reception. And my brother introduced me to his Sunday school teacher. And right away, the Sunday school teacher said to me, he said, 
I don't believe it makes any difference which day we go to church. I paused for a moment. There was a bit of silence. And I said quietly to him, God says there's a difference. Well, he said there are so many people who don't go to church at all. I mean, even if they, even, they don't know about God. If they went to church on Tuesday. I mean, it's a step, isn't it? That's right. It's a step. But in which direction? Is it a step towards Sabbath or is it a step towards Sunday? And if it's a step, then yours is also a step. You see, the problem with relati relativity is that it leaves us adrift in a sea of uncertainty. There is no anchor. There is nothing to count on. I mean, what's wrong with right living? Can you think of a substitute for right living? I'm so glad that God gives us clear instruction on that, aren't you? Volume 3 of the Testimonies, page 214. We should carefully study the life of Christ and his lessons of practical godliness given for the benefit of all and to be the rule of right living for all who believe on his name. Aren't we thankful for the counsels of the spirit of prophecy? Well-known author Lloyd Douglas. When he was a university student, he lived in a, um, an apartment building. Downstairs on the first floor, there was an, an elderly retired music teacher. He was infirm and was unable to leave the apartment. Douglas said that every morning they had a ritual. He would get up, and he would go out and down the steps, and he'd open the old man's door, and he would ask well, what's the good news? The old man would pick up his tuning fork and he would tap it on the side of the wheelchair. Bing! He would say, that's middle C. It was middle C yesterday. It will be middle C tomorrow. And it will be middle C a thousand years from now. This man had discovered the one thing upon which he could depend. There was a constant reality in his life. He said the tenor upstairs sings flat. <laughs> Maybe he was listening to me. The piano across the hall was out of tune. But my friend, that is middle C. And you can count on it. Yesterday, today, and forever. Perhaps you don't feel the need for some kind of certainty in your life. But I find that difficult to believe. Because I know that I must have certainty in my life. And unless you're certain concerning the tenets of your faith, you will most certainly remain adrift in a sea of confusion and uncertainty. I know for myself that I have needed that anchor in my life, that one thing I can always depend upon. I found that one thing to be Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And it is expressed, as I spoke last night, through the ever-enduring, eternal, living Word of God. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, come with me there. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 18. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 18. I love the 6th chapter of Deuteronomy. You ought to memorize that whole chapter. And when your youngster comes to you and asks you why the commandments of God are important, you can tell them right there why they're important. Verse 18 says, Thou shalt do that which is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may be well with thee. Now, at the Abuse Task Force meeting in Silver Springs, Maryland a year ago, one of our leaders said, it is more important to be kind than to be right. Now, he's right and he's wrong. I think we should express kindness in all that we do, don't you? Well, with all due respect, Mr. Leader, I would suggest to you that 
Only when you're right will you be kind. They got the cart before the horse. I mean, it's obvious that some of our folks have an aversion to being right. Should God's people be right? What's the opposite of right? Don't say left. (laughs) Do we believe that it is God's desire for us to be wrong? Of course not. It is His desire for us to be lovingly right. Confidently right. Amen? To know and understand that which is right and to do that which is right. If you're right, you'll be kind. If you're wrong, you will not be kind. I mean, I remember a preacher once who said that when you get to heaven, you will learn to be kinder. I beg to differ with him. Because if you're not kind, you're not going to be there. Right? You see, kindness for political expediency or for social expediency, it is not kindness... It's deception. God's righteousness involves kindness, and it cannot be otherwise. What are we told in Proverbs, the 14th chapter, verse 12? We all know it, don't we? There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. You see, it just seems that way. The devil deludes us into making certain things seem right. When it is wrong, it is as wrong as can be. Does God leave us unsure of what is right? Of course not. He makes it very clear, very plain in His Word, that which is right. In Mind, Character, and Personality, page 611, we read these words. She speaks of the inner satisfaction of being right. We're to choose the right because it is right. To stand for the truth at the cost of suffering and sacrifice. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. This is not our righteousness, it's His righteousness. When we have a converted heart and Christ living and dwelling within our very heart, then your rightness is kindness as well, isn't it? Deuteronomy 6.18, Thou shalt do that which is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may be well with thee, that thou mayest go in and possess the good land which the Lord has sworn unto, swore unto our fathers. When I um, learned the difference between right and wrong, I never thought, the, the idea never crossed my mind. I never thought that, that God would not extend His grace to me by being on the side of right. I never thought that it would not be fair to someone else by me being right in the Lord. Isaiah chapter 5, come with me there. Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5. And let's look at verse 20. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto those. Why... Do they feel that, that, that if striving to be right, we're legalistic? Why is it that they say that because we are right, we do not understand the issue of grace? Have you heard that before? Well, I know why. God's Word tells us why. Come with me to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. I like to hear the leaves of the pages of you. Leaves of your Bible turning. Second Peter chapter 2. In verse 10 it says, They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Verse 14 it says, Because they cannot cease from sin. And verse 15, Because they have forsaken the right way. Because they have forsaken the commandments of God, they have forsaken the right way. 
These are those who think that we are working our way to heaven by being right. Are we right? Do we attempt to be right by the power of the Lord to get to heaven? Is that our motive? Why should we be right in the Lord? Because He is our righteousness. He's the one we love more than anything this world can ever have to offer. We're not working our way to heaven. We love our Heavenly Father. We love Jesus Christ. Therefore, we want to do that which is right to please Him. You see, when we become one with Christ, are we wrong when we become one with Christ? When we become one with Christ, we become right. If you were ever tried in a court of law for standing for that which is right, would you be found guilty? I would hope that in a case where I would be tried for my religious convictions that I would be found guilty as charged for being right. If you were to be brought before your superiors, or if you were hauled in before a union tribunal, which I have, would you be found guilty? I hope so. But more important than that, I would hope that my influence would be strong enough through the power of God to change hearts in that scenario, wouldn't you? We are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And in order to do this, we must be on the right course. Have you ever had someone say, you're legalistic to be concerned about behavior or doing the right thing? I mean, these poor deluded people have made these statements. They, they, they have an ethereal concept of Jesus. They're lacking material substance. The Bible-based principles upon which most of us hold to are considered strange to the modern liberal. This is not really something new, though. It has happened before. You may recall the story, if you're familiar with the story of the, the roots of our church, of the faithful pioneers, and how that the Harmon family, the Harmon family, they were disfellowshipped from the Chestnut Street Baptist Church, or, or Methodist Church. And they were disfellowshipped because of their strange beliefs. The Methodist minister called upon their home and informed them that their new... Uh, Faith was not compatible with the church and not acceptable. He never entered into a discussion as to why the, the Harmons were wrong in their newfound beliefs. He never attempted to convince them or present to them what he considered truth. And you know, that could be frustrating, can't it? Mr. Harmon, he told the minister that he, he, he must be mistaken in calling this a new and strange doctrine because this was exactly what Jesus taught when he was on this earth. He was prepared to quote scripture in defense of his faith. He said, that's a very old doctrine that bears no taint of heresy. Well, rather than responding with scripture of his own, this Methodist minister advised the family to quietly withdraw from the church to avoid publicity of a trial. He used the argumentum ad hominem principle. In other words, he couldn't confront the message, so he confronted the messenger. This wasn't acceptable to Mr. Harmon. He knew that there would be others that would be suffering the same treatment. And these also needed to be encouraged that the Harmons were not ashamed of the truth which they held. And they could present Christ's word that would prove, prove them right to be a witness to them. And encouragement to these others that would be brought in as well. Do you suppose the Harmons were, were condemned for claiming to be right? Was it wrong for them to be right? The Harmons were tried by a church tribunal. Though there were very few present, and, and, and rather than enter into a controversy on the issues in which they knew very well they had no scriptural proof to back them up, the charge that was preferred against the Harmons was that they walked contrary to the rules of the church. 
And when Mr. Harmon asked, well, what rules of the church have we violated? There was a bit of hesitation, but then the leaders of the church stated that they had attended other meetings and neglected to meet regularly with their class. When asked if they would confess that they had departed from their rules and would conform in the future, the Harmons refused to recant. Beloved, these tribunals have not ceased. They will not cease so long as God's true and faithful children hold fast to that which is right. You're called to be conformed to truth. You're called to be conformed to that which is right. Beloved, we're living in very serious times. Can we agree on that this morning? We're living in a time when things that used to matter in the church don't matter anymore to many. They tell us that all the rules have been changed. They tell us that we're too old-fashioned. We don't believe that way anymore. I can't think of anything more old-fashioned than this, can you? We don't use hymnals anymore. I mean, God doesn't look at what I wear or how I dress for church. Let me ask you something, beloved. How do we, how do we explain to our children that our values have now changed? Values that we have instilled in their minds from their infancy? How do we tell them? How do you answer a child when he asks his parents, um, Mom, Dad, <coughs> why are you now wearing a wedding ring? Something that he'd been taught in kindergarten was wrong. How do we explain that? How do we explain the things that we... We, we once upheld for so many years and now exchanging it for something that cannot be validated by Scripture. Amen. How do you explain that to a child? What's wrong with old-fashioned living? What's wrong with old-fashioned sermons? Does that ring a bell in the spirit of prophecy? What do we need? We need old-fashioned fathers and mothers in Israel. We need old-fashioned sermons. Well, I'll tell you what's wrong, what I think is wrong. I believe that those in our midst that are unconverted, and I'm not pointing fingers. We know that's a fact. I believe they get bored with these same marvelous truths year after year. You see, there's no heart change. Evidently, these folks have been on a treadmill all these years of, of rote, uh, dull monotony. Oh, finally, I'm free. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All these years, they've been entrapped. Their motives were not correct in what they were doing. Now, that's legalism. I believe that we need, when I say the church, I'm speaking of me. I'm speaking of us all. We need to enter into deep soul-searching prayer. We need to ask for mercy. We as a church must search our hearts. I mean, after 37 years of ministry, the church cannot prost uh, prostitute its God-giving principles to me. And I hope to none of you. Are we in agreement? I am not going to resurrect that which I have put away. When my wife and I were married, I remember when we took our wedding bands off, when we were studying this message. She went into one room, I went into another. We didn't know what each other were doing. We'd only been married just months. She comes out with her wedding band in her hand. And I come out with my hand closed. We took those bands off. And I never looked back. Amen. Praise the Lord. Never looked back. 
Do you believe that everyone needs a standard? God has a standard. He has a standard for dress, for reverence, for music. He has a standard for all, everything that he does. Everything that we do, there is a standard. The last church I pastored, we had a policy that I had the board approve. We drew it up, a music policy. When you come into this pulpit to, to present special music, that is a ministry. It's important to the pastor who is sitting there wanting to be filled with the Holy Spirit through that music. You've got people out there wanting to be filled with the Holy Spirit from what they're about to hear. The music and the message. And I say, when you come up, you have five minutes. No long sermon before you sing. You have five minutes. You need to be dressed appropriately. You cannot use canned music. Not that all canned music is bad, but because there may be one that would be offended, I just say no canned music. We have plenty of musicians here in the church who can play for you. Someone will say, Pastor Dan, standards, they aren't an issue of salvation. That's right. <laughs> Maybe not directly. But I can assure you that they're closely related because the outward appearance and behavior makes a clear statement as to who lives in your heart. Amen? God's people will be a positive influence on others. The people of my church knew what I expected of them. I say to them, well, as your pastor, I'm going to let you come up here. I'm not going to let you come up here with earrings, sloppy clothes. You must dress modestly. Why can't we make right decisions for the church? You're going to lose some people sometimes. But you know most people respect you for your convictions. I've had people offended because of the stance I've taken in church. And they remain by and I can see the change week by week. We should do the right thing regardless of whether anyone agrees with it or not. You know, God was the one who said you must wear clothes. I'm just following up on his sound counsel. We need folks who say, I'm not going to change. I mean, everything has standards. Delta has standards. McDonald's has standards. Uh, Disney World, if you're not of a certain age, you're not going to get on that ride, right? These are the things you do because you must do them. Somebody correct me. These are the things you do because you love him. Thank you. You love him. Forty-three years ago, I married a beautiful lady. She's still beautiful. She's lovely. She's intelligent. And she loves the Lord Jesus Christ with all of her heart. She immediately became my soulmate 43 years ago. It only took a matter of minutes for us to get married legally. So I brought her home and I treated her unkindly and I upset her and I showed her a piece of paper. Hey, we're married. Look, we're married. Right? See, see that right there? We're married. I'm not a backslider. I'm married. Beloved, the way I treat my sweetheart determines whether I'm happily married or whether I stay married. I love my wife enough that I wouldn't dream of making her unhappy. I wouldn't dream of being uncruel to her. Now, I'll be the first to admit we've made some mistakes along the way. But not intentionally, mind you. Listen, darling. Still love you. <laughs> you can slip away from your devotional life. But sooner or later, you will encounter the need for the reserve which you have failed to deposit into heaven's bank account. There are many folks who don't want to miss eternal life. But many of those same folks who don't want to miss eternal life do not want heaven to tell them what to do. Amen. What's wrong with making the Lord happy? Listen to me. He loves you. He loves you with an undying love. He even loves you so much 
that that love will finally let you go. And even that is love. Even that is love. The rich young ruler said, what must I do? He asked the question, what must I do? We must pray. What can I do, Lord, to make you happy? I want to make you happy. I love you, Lord, with all of my heart and my soul. You won't be happy until you do that which pleases the Lord. I'd like you to bow your heads with me as we contemplate this most important subject. Lord, <clears throat> is your heart cumbered down with something that's not right? Is there something in your life that just seems to be nagging at you day in and day out and you can't seem to get the victory? Is there something that is not right? And you say to the Lord, I want to do that thing which is right. Give me the courage to do that which is right. Even though I'll be considered as wrong, give me your gracious spirit. Even though I may be misunderstood, give me the wisdom and the love and the tender compassion. Even though I may be considered judgmental and intolerant, oh Lord, may it not be true. Give me of your sweet spirit and grace. Give me the spiritual power to do the right thing. Amen and amen. Ah, oh, it's... It's a sweet thing to be right in the spirit of the Lord.